to South Dakota and Oregon and Washington and Michigan. And then we're going to Washington, D.C. to take back the White House. Yeah! Hi, everybody. Welcome to Second in Command of Veep Rewatch. I'm Tim Simons. I played Jonah Ryan. I'm Matt Walsh. I played Mike McClintock. And we are going to look at this show from the lowest rung of a very high ladder. On this episode, we'll be talking about uh, episode number four, Chum. It was written by Sean Gray, Will Smith, and Armando Iannucci, directed by Armando Iannucci, and it began filming October 26th, 2011. Uh, what you heard on the intro was Howard Dean at the Valier Ballroom in West Des Moines, Iowa, uh, during uh, his presidential campaign. And that scream, he was number one in every single poll, and that scream on... January 19th, 2004, torpedoed his campaign. It was completely done after he screamed. Uh, so that is what you were mm -hmm. listening to on the way in back when a scream could uh, completely derail your campaign. Uh, really excited. It mirrors, it mirrors the show Veep in that a lot of small stakes things drove the plot in the early seasons. That's true. I remember I had never heard it. I knew about it, but I had never actually heard it. I wasn't like watching a lot of news at the time. I was like a young drunk in Chicago and I like just didn't care and I wasn't paying attention. So I understood that it happened. But when I heard it, I was like, that's it. Like, that's what killed that guy's campaign. That is like mm -hmm. the most low stakes thing that has ever happened that actually killed somebody's campaign. Anyway, I'm really excited about today's episode because we have one of my favorite care, one of my favorite actors from the show who played Sidney Purcell. Uh, his name is Pete Gross. I constantly fuck up his last name. I've been fucking it up for over 10 years now. I pronounce You will again. I, I believe you will again. I, I lean hard into the T of his last name. There is no T. There isn't? Yeah, there is. Oh, there is. There is. You're right. I'm sorry. There is. See, you're doing it Phonetically. right. Phonetically, you, there's no T. In your mind, you just take the T out, and so you always pronounce it correctly. And in my mind, I put it in there, and I'm always tripping up on it. Well, I learn phonetically, and you learn visually, I think is what we're learning. We're really excited to have uh, Pete Gross on. Um, he's incredibly funny uh, and a wonderful guy, despite, uh, how, despite accessing whatever he has to access of himself to play Sydney. Yes. Let's, you you want to bring him up? Yeah, come on, Pete. We're really happy to have uh, Pete Groats with us. Pete, Gr I've always put the T in it. Pete Gross. Pete you Gross. always say Groats. Pete right? Gross. I, I put the T in it since I've known you, and I feel embarrassed. Yeah, no one's ever done that. It's like a like an Ellis Island move, but it doesn't make it any better. It makes it worse. <laughs> I'm <laughs> not Americanizing it at all. <laughs> I meant to tell you it's not groats before we got on air, but that's my bad too. And I really feel like I should have, like, nobody was talking. I feel like, Walshy, I probably should have let you do the intro, but nobody was talking and I just had to fill the silence. Uh, that's what radio and podcasts are. Just keep talking and don't let yeah. any dead air, dead air happen. Yeah. But you made the first spelling error in an audio <laughs> only uh, <laughs> medium. <laughs> I wish we could track when people click off because that might click, you know, that might send some people away. I just want to say I admire Pete because he has such a fascinating career. He's a writer, performer, and I feel like every time I'm like listening to NPR, you're doing some like fun show on NPR. So, yeah, uh, that's, I that's do sincerely true. mean that. You have a very interesting, fun career. So, thank you. I just want, I I just want to throw well. that out there. And okay. also, you embodied, Tim put it well, we, we watched Sidney Purcell's first appearance in, I believe, episode two of season one, and you were pitch perfect from, like, line one. Sidney Purcell oh, thank you. is the oil lobbyist who's a real bastard, and like many characters, it's just a filthy, foul mouth motherfucker who doesn't pull any punches, and... As written, you had to deliver that right away, and it was really fun to see you at uh, Rapey Reeves' funeral. The, the con <laughs> yeah, yeah, that the was very fun. The congressman who died, uh, yeah, at the pool center. Yeah, that was the first uh, thing I did. I remember being very excited to audition, but also intimidated because I think that I think it was maybe just the first audition, or maybe it was, I assume it was a callback. But Julia was in the callback. And it was like, do the scene with her. And if, you know, it was just improvise, like, here's what's going on. 
and then go past like improvise past the scene, like do it and then put it down and then just have a conversation with her. And I, I think I just found myself, it's good that we did the scene first cause it kind of warmed up, but I found myself being like a real asshole to this, you know, person that I'd never met before, <laughs> but, just, but I was idolizing her from, from afar. And I think I, th- I think I threatened like suddenly like almost mob style her with like physical violence. It was like, it would, be a, it would be a shame if, you know, like it was one of those things. And I, I think she was like, I think she looked at our and was like, Oh, interesting. I'm actually going to, yeah. in, in, in rewatching it, Pete, I'm actually going to go a step further than what Walsh said, because you managed to find where we all should have been a lot sooner, which was completely <laughs> nihilistic. Like, I almost feel like we were naive. And, and I was thinking about this today, that an oil man, like, there is no redeeming quality to that. You cheat into that. Like, there is nothing redeeming about this person right off. This is just move forward, get what I want. It doesn't matter if everything burns. And we yeah, were still looking sharky. for redeeming qualities I think that that's, I mean, I don't know how you guys are approaching it, but it makes sense that you would be like, oh, well, what is it about this like guy who's just like, seems like he's such a prick and only there to bother people, um, you know, or like he's just like, he, he's so ineffectual and terrible at his job, but you have to, you have to make like, you have to find something good about them. So people are like, oh, I like Jonah. Yeah. You know, nobody really likes Jonah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, that was not like, that's not a, um, that's not the, the um the it's not on the table for <laughs> Sydney Purcell. Um yeah, it was definitely e- it was a little bit easier maybe to just be like a complete asshole like r- just right off the bat. Um but it was so fun. It was so fun. There's a line from your the next episode which is one of uh which is one of my favorites in the, I think the entire show top to bottom. It's when you're talking yeah. about like you have this whole lie about how you have kids like you know I want a bright future yeah. for my kids and then as yeah. soon as yeah. Selena walks away you say I don't have kids. I've got a niece but I fucking hate her. And it's so clear <laughs> that you actually do hate her. <laughs> I just like it's that darkness, it's that nihilism yeah. that it feels like you had from the first moment. Yeah, I mean, I didn't make that up or anything. We certainly improvised a, a fair bit, but that was definitely that was definitely in the the script. I wonder. I never asked those guys because I know they there was a lot of uh, a lot of people were based on archetypes or spe- or sometimes specific people. But I, I I think maybe Sydney was just like a conglomeration of all the all the evil shit that oozes around that town. You know, he was like a yeah, and, specific person. Yeah, and he, like you said, he came out guns blazing. He was like, like we all were sort of compromised by the end of the run of the show. And we were all sort of just beaten down and doing whatever we could and saying whatever we had to to survive. And Sydney was one yeah. of those characters who was shocking because he was in contrast to sort of other people who hadn't gotten there yet. And it was pretty fun. Obviously. Well, it's funny. Well, I bet back at all, like when you first see back at all, he's probably not as intense and then just got way more, way more intense. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think he was probably like 70% or 60% filthy. And by the end, he was like 90% filthy mm-hmm. would be my guess. Maybe I'll read the uh, summary for the episode. What do you think of that guy? Yeah, start there. That's a good sure. idea. This episode is episode four called Chung played by Randall Park, who's introducing that character. And the episode synopsis is Dan and Amy attend a book launch for Governor Danny Chung, a charismatic Asian-American war hero who Selena worries could be a political threat. Following an interview on Meet the Press, a slip of the tongue by Selena is misconstrued as a racist dig at one of her political rivals. The VP and her team go into recovery mode, trying to take the spotlight off Selena by visiting the sick and injured at a local hospital. I just want to throw this out right at the beginning that uh, Randall Park, who plays Danny Chung, before we even get into it, we had like a recurring bit where we would somehow all end up getting cast in the same things. Like we ended up on the same sets in sort of parts large or small, not by our doing, but it all started 
uh, the week that I got cast on the show, and I sent this to Arvin earlier. Arvin, do you have this queued up? Danny, uh, this, Randall Park and I were in an ad. We're in a commercial for HBO Go. When HBO Go was like a novel HBO. thing. Do you remember? This really? is like the launch of the what is now HBO Max. But uh, I'm going to have Arvin throw it up. Uh, uh, uh. It's better when it's closer. It's better when it's closer to the center. It... Hear that? Hear that? Hear, hear that? It... Hear how it changes? Hear how it changes? Uh... I remember going up to Randall and being like, hey man, have you ever tested for a show before? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, tell me everything that you know about it because I don't know anything about it. And it's happening in like oh, a wow. day and a half. Wow. And then we, and then, so then, yeah, like a, like a couple months later, we were doing this together and it just kind of happened. So Randall and I, uh, Randall is a wonderful guy. Um, and well, my only humble brag with Randall is he used to live in Valley village, which was my old neighborhood in, in, uh, <laughs> It's not as cool as doing a commercial. That's a with great him. story. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Does that count Maybe as a you story? Edit out Tim's story? I think edit out Tim's story. I think definitely. Just, I don't want to tell you how to do your show, but it's, it's like, maybe please, we need all the help. This is early days. So we're still, <laughs> we're still working the kinks out. So I'll take it. Uh, so the first scene is Dan and Amy uh, spending their Friday lunch, going to a book signing for governor Danny Chung. Um, and the first Thing that happens is oh she mentions and this is going to come up in a second or dan mentions that um that the, why are they doing that and it's because it's better than uh it's better than watching uh gary drip noodle juice down his chin but it's clear as well that uh that he uh that danny chung has political capital that is drawing people there mm-hmm. including the release of this new book what's the book called walshie do you remember i don't remember Never. It's like born to serve or something oh. like that. It has something yeah. to do with the good fight. Arvin comes so. in hot to redeem himself. The good fight. <laughs> That's what it is. I have a quick sidebar for you too. So uh, yeah. we've uncovered some of the first season scripts. Guess how long the Ooh. script was for this episode? Because Veep is notoriously, we had long scripts. Any guesses? We're just going to guess a number and see how close. 63 Well, pages. it's probably for Tim. Good guess. I'm going to say, I feel like we didn't get into the 60s until, like, unless it was real fucked up. So I'm going to say, like, 55. 76. I'm just going to tell you, 76 pages. 76 pages. 76 pages? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of alts in here, and there's some spaces. And one of the alts, I'll just give you an alt, when because Danny Chung leaves the scene. I'm I'm kind of writing the script at the same time. Danny Chung leaves the scene, and there's something about he who speaks in maxims sounds wise. But the (laughs) alt... The alt joke, which never made it in, is uh, Dan says, I find him very sexually charismatic. Do you? Or are you still unable to look at other men in that way? <laughs> just, just to kind of... <laughs> I just love the alt. About them dating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's really funny. And the other alt is the Senator Doyle, on the same page, a Senator Doyle alt is, uh, you want a game, son? How about I cut your dick off so you can play fetch? <laughs> <laughs> So, at, so what Doyle's happens great. after they have their, like, great. he has this sort of false humbleness throughout all like this sort of very like, oh, you know, like, you know, uh, if she's on Meet the Press, then I don't even need to show up at uh, like right. I'm, I'm doing the other Sunday show and if all eyes are going to be on her. He has this sort of f- fake humbleness about everything. And as he walks off, Doyle comes up. Amy has a great moment where she gets really excited about a sandwich and says, oh, is that cornbread? I just really like the fact that she's stoked mm-hmm. about the cornbread. But Doyle comes yeah. over, they have this conversation where he's pissed off about uh, where he's pissed off about the uh, uh, the clean jobs, uh, the clean jobs task force. Uh, and he mentions withdrawing, which is something that he can do and he's going to withdraw. And Dan, he, Amy is just hungry and thinking about the cornbread and is like, does that, and Dan is like, does that mean that he's going to withdraw from the filibuster reform vote? And there's another great all about that, and which is like, you know, the line as written is like, nobody actually uses withdraw from a conversation like that. They don't use withdraw as a verb in that it way. Is a verb, yeah. 
And and there's an art that's like like did Paul, did Peter Paul and Mary sing I'm withdrawing on a jet plane? Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and throw it out. I don't have confirmation, but I think that was a Simon Blackwell line. Like Simon Blackwell, whenever there's a folk music reference, I feel like if we're gonna talk about like April Come She Will, um, like a right. Simon and Garfunkel thing, I think there might be one of those in there. I feel like that's always gonna be Simon Blackwell. I don't know if it's his favorite kind of music. I just think that he always found humor in in sixties and seventies folk lyrics. Yeah, yeah. The contrast between the the horrible way that everybody treats each other and folk lyrics can be pretty uh, yeah. interesting. <laughs> so I feel like Randall does such a good job. Another person right away, who the first time you see him, that that false humility is like at a ten. It's it's really really great. You could just tell right away that that's a character that does not uh, believe any of the like bullshit that he's saying that's like i'm just one man you know and all i did was serve my country like it's so gross the way that he says it it's it's yeah it's, it's fantastic i realized that watch rewatching it and it's one of those jokes that i always laughed at is when he gets to tell the tank story because every time for the first whatever four episodes he appeared he would always tell people he pulled somebody out of a oh yeah tank yeah, burning tank, and then you don't you have a line? Doesn't Mike have a line that's like, maybe yeah, if anything, he's crazy. bad at his job because he was slow. The guy got burned, slow. <laughs> he's bad at his job, also. And then he's your dad, Mike, is like doubting whether or not military valor is real. Like, yeah. so, look, that's what you're supposed to do. What do you mean, no, yeah, right man behind or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The laziest guy in the world is complaining that the military gets too much credit for how active they are. True. There is Dan, true, true. Randall did sort of put an un, like, and you can also, you can tell he's so good at selling that false humility, that exact thing that you're talking about, like that it makes yeah. sense that everybody is so attracted to him politically, like why he's getting so much attention. It makes sense because he is really good at selling the bullshit that a lot of people aren't great at. I thought the show also did a good job just in the writing and conception of it. Even, I mean, right away, I forgot how right away in the first season, she was already looking over her shoulder at people who could replace her or other people in her party who could usurp her. She wasn't just always next in line. And it was, it's interesting that it, it did a good job of like, oh, well, she's, you know, she's a woman. It would be so interesting to have a female vice president. But then you're like, oh, a Chinese American war hero, and that just like blows like just a woman president yeah. out of the water. <laughs> that so that actually comes up in the next scene. We go into the uh, Mike and Selena are prepping for Meet the Press, uh, and they're going through all the things they have. Like we were playing. I don't think this was written to be the Ravens, and I don't think any of the Brits cared about football. I think yeah. we were it was definitely Louis. we were playing to the crew on that one. Well, I think, too, that's just another example of, like, there was always little things that we had to fill in that weren't necessarily in the script, whether it was, like, a deeper dive on who played for the Ravens or betting a beer. Like, that's a very, like, I, I always feel like in Chicago, the mayors bet, you know, when, when we play the Detroit or Cleveland, yeah. or the mayors always bet a beer or something. And that was, that seemingly is something that the writers always wanted a little bit of nuance about. Like, what, what would go well here? And. In, oh, and right after that, right after they talk about the, uh, the, all the meet the press stuff, they're all done prepping and they go out and that's when she talks to Amy and Dan about, like, about Chung being over, being over the shoulder and that worry that, that Pete, that you were talking about, like the, yeah. the, oh no, like, did you get a sense of this? And like, everything was a slight, every mention of him was a slight, like, what does that mean? She's trying to analyze it. Didn't he sign her book, right? He wrote like... Uh, Selena oh. with an A. Oh, yeah, yeah, he, wrote Selena. he signed Selena. it with an A. He signed it with an A, <laughs> and also said from an admiring wannabe. And she's like, "What does that mean? Does that mean he wants to be vice president?" Like every little thing, right. she's gonna. There's also a great moment that Julia has here. This is the first setup to end what ends up being like one of my favorite jokes in season like four or five, which is this banana is broken where she goes over to the coffee machine as if she's going to be the kind of person that will make her own coffee, looks at it for a second, and then just looks at Gary and je like Gary and just gestures to it. Like, I don't know. This is not what I do. Right. <laughs> yeah. There were so many rehearsals, just to take a sidebar for a second. Please, please. I, and it, it didn't happen as much later, but I do remember I've never rehearsed so much for a show. 
And it, it was, maybe you guys got tired of it doing, you know, however many episodes, but I always thought it was so fun to be able to not just rehearse the scenes, but it was like, you'd rehearse the scenes, you'd get them up on their feet, and then you'd improvise through them again, at basically do them and then, you know, kind of have a general shape and then put the script down and then just basically get from A to B in the same, in the same sort of path generally, but you could just say whatever you wanted. And some of the lines that were in the script, you just sort of remembered. But there were so many things that either came up like physical bits, like you guys were saying, or specific lines that eventually made it into the show. And it was so cool that the writers were so, and Armando was so um, like excited about that, that they would just like give the cast the chance to add and, and uh, change things around. And I just, I also just remember watching other people do their scenes was really, really fun. Just being in that big room and then watching, like I remember watching back at all and, and uh, Dan back at all and Julia do a scene, I think in like season four, we were still in Baltimore. And God, it was so, it was a great status scene. And they just, they, they improvised for like seven minutes or something it was like way <laughs> past as long as the scene was going to be, but it was just beautiful to watch. It was really great. It's funny because your, your comfort level, because of your background, you loved the rehearsal process, but a lot of actors, actor, actors, cause a lot, we drew from the show drew from New yeah. York and the first four seasons, they were straight up like, give me the lines. I'll knock it out of the park. Yeah. They got really stressed out or insecure about the rehearsal process at times. Interesting. Cause they didn't, they didn't feel as comfortable. They also felt the burden to be funny. Cause they would, like you said, we would watch people like you or Dan or, or the regulars on the show who would inevitably stumble on something funny and then they would pursue it. Cause their training is they're like, Oh, there's something funny. Let's stay in this moment, you know? Yeah. And so they felt it made them feel a little insecure, but inevitably they were always encouraged, like, just play it real. We're, nobody knows what the fuck they're doing. Some of, most of the stuff will never see the light of day. So yeah. feel, you know, feel free to fail. You know, that was the general mantra to tell people who came in. Yeah. But, but it is hard. It's hard to be like, come, uh, where you're hired to be an actor. And now, like, it's hard to c tell somebody, like, go into this room of people, of regulars on a TV show and, and just like, if you fuck up, it's fine. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. like, that's not a normal, that's not a normal like uh, experience for an actor, but I, I did find it pretty fun. Mm -hmm. It's like being in a gym, you know, it's like going to a, to a gym and just shooting around, you know. There was, yeah. I, I don't know if you ever remember this, but one of the things that would happen is that like in that seven minute thing that Julia would do with, with back at all, they never actually recorded them. I think they used to, what they, when they were doing the thick of it, they would actually record it and then have somebody transcribe it so they didn't miss anything. Oh, that's and after a while, yeah. they were just like, there was so much stuff that we couldn't even go through it. And it all came down to the big, good things, the things that really worked, we will remember. We will make our own yeah, little exactly. notes, but like the bit, the thing yeah. that sticks out that sort of congeals it all together, we'll just remember. Um, which I always thought was interesting in that way of like people, they were just not worried about missing something because they were just like, well, if it's good, we'll remember. Um, yeah. Yeah. They probably went back to the writer's room and like, if, if nobody could remember it, it wasn't that good. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. All right. So the next plot point is at the end of the day, Jonah barges in with a new directive for Selena's meet the press interview. Instead of filibuster reform, she has to talk about immigration reform and pump up okay. China as a trade partner. And this is also like one of the things that gets said to me the most that, that I'm not even my mom's favorite Jonah. I don't know. Like this, <laughs> ah, this is like one of those ones from like mid season, season one, that is just like, every, like you're not even your mom's favorite. Like I get that Instagram comment on almost every single thing that I put up. Like That's even cool. if it's wow. just like, a, it's like a picture of me and my mom, like forget it, forget it. That's going to come up a lot. So that's how he introduces himself. He says, hey, everybody, it's that's your favorite funny. Jonah. And Amy responds with, you're not even your mom's favorite Jonah. It's a great line. It's a total throwaway, but it's, it's great. So in, that, uh, so in that moment, yeah, he changes up the talking points. They start to walk away. They actually start out in the hallway uh, to go home for the weekend. Uh, and then she just has, they just all have to turn right back in and take their coats off and figure out how to go right. through with all the new talking points. And again, this is like another great physical comedy moment that Sue has that I feel like her arm doesn't hit super hard, which is that when she calls, when Selena calls out for Sue, she says, Sue, 
were staying. And then you just see Sue like pass in the background. You see her pass through the door frame in the background, taking off her coat and saying, yeah. Yeah. Just like... (laughs) Yeah. Was that the one then yeah. the next, well, you'll tell me next, but is it like the next morning then they've been up all night or? We find out Scott gives research that says Chung was born in China, making right. him ineligible. Right. So Amy, I think Amy delivers that from Scott. Right. But that is a little, that's a little bit later. What we first find is the. Oh, first, is that where they wake up? We see the boyfriend. Yeah. We see the introduction of Ted, her yeah. sort of yes. like DC her DC lawyer boyfriend who, and I love who played by Andy Buckley, who's amazing. But I also kind of it's love amazing. like, that is like, I do kind of love that. Like Andy Buckley as like a DC powerhouse lawyer is the sexiest thing in town. Just like they are so <laughs> dirty, like right off the bat. They They're are so, so dirty. dirty. That is like the They're height so dirty. of just, just the height of manliness and sensuality in that town. And so they like the Amy and Gary overhear all the disgusting shit that they are saying to one another first. And before it's so we gross. Get, it's like hearing your parents talk about having sex and you're like halfway up the stairs and you have to listen to them like finish talking about it. And you're like, and then there is an alt in there where Gary says something like, it seems like you had a great Saturday night. And Selena says, you need did not do that. You can't, whenever you make an attempt at human connection, it really comes out wrong. <laughs> Just like shuts that down immediately. And this I just is- want to say that, that that scene where Julia and Andy are like sort of making out before she has to get in the limo. I remember like her telling him like, go for it. Like, we're really going to like offend people. And he was basically like told to like grope her and rub up against, you know, they really went yeah. for it in the best way. Like, here's where the comedy is. We have to shock Amy and Gary on the stairs. Yeah. So feel mm-hmm. free to like, just really go for it. And I was, I was like, I can't believe these two actors don't even know each other day one. And they're just like bang on, you know, rubbing on top of each other. And it was very, uh, it was very believable. I also thought their phone call, which comes later, was very believable. But they, and it also just, it, it, it's a like introducing Selena's sex life in the show. It's it plays such a good role throughout the seasons when she has the when is it what's his name? He comes in as the personal trainer. Yeah, the personal trainer stuff or and John everything slattery. with Swayze. Yeah, and Slattery. Her, but like her back and forth with her hus- ex husband. So great because they have such a good connection. Like they look yes. at each other, and you're like, God, those people cannot. Uh, they all they're thinking about is having sex with each other. Yes. Yeah, they yes. want they want the, they want everybody in the room to go away, and they have such they know they're going to hate each other five minutes afterwards. Yeah. They just yes. want to jump each other's bones. It's so funny, and they're yes. so physically mismatched. Yeah. He's so tall, and she's much smaller than him. It's very funny. There is one of my, uh, a, a moment that I really like that comes right before we get the, the bad Chung news, which is that she opens the door. She opens the door and finds Mike sleeping. And he, imme- oh, yeah. and there's also a good, there's a, there's a good Matt Walsh adjust, adjustment here, which is he immediately wakes up and says, I was just visualizing how you're going to kill it on Meet the Press. And as, and, as, right. and as scripted, as scripted, it says, I wasn't sleeping. I was just visualizing about how you, but like one thing that I love is that like, we've talked about this a lot, that like Mike is more seasoned than people give him credit for. And he's way better at his job than people give him credit for. And like a rookie would say, I wasn't sleeping. I was bad, but yeah, Mike yeah, yeah. just goes right to it. And then she like, and he's wearing the salmon pants. The salmon pants got a lot of uh, play. People were excited oh, yeah, about that's true. finding the salmon pants. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Julia sits down or Selena sits down and says, I don't know why you're so tired. It's, I don't know why you're so you don't tired. Do you don't do anything. <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> like sometimes, the, sometimes the most simple put down or the, sometimes the best put downs in the show are the simplest ones and that is like i don't know why you're so tired don't fucking do anything like you're just yeah, so great it's really funny so the information yeah, that we get it. that ends up being incorrect is that actually uh danny chung uh is not a threat 
because he he was born in China before his father was a natural born citizen. Obama had been elected and was in office for a couple of years. So this was a direct play on the birther stuff. Like this was, was actually taken from that. Yeah. It was a version of that. And mm-hmm. also, I do think it was also at a time where it was still kind of not, not that I don't know if this is the right word, but like allowed to be funny in that you're like, nobody's actually ever going to buy into this shit. But like Donald right. Trump had done the thing where he like got Obama to release his birth certificate, but he looked like a fucking clown doing it and like got yeah. out of the helicopter and did that, had that moment where he was like, I am so proud of myself for getting this birth oh certificate released. I mean, like, yeah. and at the time it was like, well, this is like a safe thing to joke about because everybody's in on the joke because this is what an idiot would think. And, uh, well, good job, everybody. <laughs> How did yeah, how did now. that go? It's time for Sue. Did the president call? No, but these fans did. Hi Tim. Hi Matt. My name is Ayu, and I'm from Indonesia. Within the seven season spans of Veep, there are many guest stars and recurring actors, and some of them were promoted to regular cast like Gary Cole and Sam Richardson. Since you both have been the regulars since the beginning. Uh, do you guys have any guest stars that you wish could be the regular cast? Thank you. One of the first people that I thought might be sticking around longer that was a great guest star was uh, Selena's trainer, Chris Maloney. Uh, he played Ray, and yeah. he was like her her boyfriend slash F buddy, massage buddy, whatever they were doing when the doors were closed. But that's an example of someone like, oh my God, he should be on the show all the time because he was just so funny in the episode immediately became about him and that's a good sign this is good this is not me avoiding answering the question but i just want to bring it up because it came into my mind that like both uh gary cole and kevin dunn were guest stars when they came in on the second season so they got promoted to series regulars i think they were the the third season on they were series regulars and the same with uh Sam, he was Sam. Sam was a series regular starting at the beginning of the third season. No, I don't think he was made a series regular until season four. Until season four. Okay, so but what's really funny about those guys, and I think it speaks to it speaks, and the same thing with Clea and the same thing with Sarah, who ended up, I think, were definitely series regulars by the last two seasons that they weren't before that. I now can't remember the show without Kevin Dunn. I can't remember the show without Gary Cole or Sam. They came on the show and they fit so perfectly that you can't, I, I will talk to them and be like, we remember first season when we were doing X, Y, Z. And they were like, we weren't there yet. You know what I mean? It's, it's also like, it's a good question, first of all, but in a way, the meaning of it is arbitrary to me because you think of like Hugh Laurie, like he was a pillar to the yeah. show for so long. Or you think of Roger Furlong, he was a pillar to the show and he always, ex- once he was in the universe, he was used either in dialogue or he was used physically. So in some ways, the people who weren't series regulars, you couldn't imagine the show without them. Yeah. And ultimately there is also probably this idea that like the idea of like a series regular or recurring guest star, like that's, what, I mean, like this is going to be a sports analogy, but that's almost like how many scholarships you have. Like, was not Baker Mayfield a walk on? at Oklahoma like he transferred out but he couldn't technically be a scholarship player so he had to like be a walk-on but clearly he's like one of the leaders of the team like you know that might just come down to like we have the budget for five series regulars so everybody else has to be but like that doesn't that doesn't diminish their importance in the show like the furlongs uh, like Dan Backadall's importance in the show is huge even if he never had like in a title of series regular and as it relates to this episode, which is about Danny Chung, played by Randall Park, they loved him and they wanted to write so much more stuff for him. But Randall's career just started launching yeah. around the same time that he became, uh, you know, Governor Chung. And so they were constantly trying to get him on and his windows were just getting smaller and smaller. So it's, a, it's also a matter of like, who can you get at some point in their career? Yeah. So we... 
we get to meet the press. It's all going great. You can see why Selena is such a seasoned pro. We find out that there is going to be a rookie. Sam Finnegan is going to be subbing in for the normal meet the press guy. Uh, and yeah. and Mike, Mike just says, I think he's a Bears fan. He doesn't even help her. He like, <laughs> I think he's a Bears fan. <laughs> so they, everybody's excited because really she's like whatever I'm going to eat him alive he's a rookie I'm not worried about this so now she's at completely at ease uh, Sam Finnegan was played by Ron Perkins and I just want to shout him out only because he does a great job of coming in and doing exactly what that role requires and he's a he doesn't try to like make a bunch of jokes he doesn't try to come in and be like a funny meet the press host he is just yeah. A meet the press host. Like I, I, it, I, it, he has, you get the vibe from him that he might've actually just been the backup meet the press guy that we somehow got on the show. Yeah, He was good. There are uh, actors that are good at playing reporters are, it's very difficult because you have to pretend to have like a, a level of reality and artifice at the same time. You have to be like believable that you are somebody who is presenting something and isn't like a good actor. Because like most, most, you know, news people, they're not acting like real people when they're doing their thing. They're acting like someone who is on TV being believable. It's like a very small um, target for an actor to portray, I think is, as like a, as a person, it's, it's maybe even easier to just like be a news person, but to be an actor pretending to be a character who is a news person is not easy. Cause I've, I've, we've like auditioned, I've auditioned people for things and stuff that I've done. And the people who are really good, you're like, that's it. Everyone else is terrible. <laughs> this one person <laughs> is the person who can do it. It's really hard. Do you think it's people tend to do too much, Pete? I think maybe. Yeah. I think it's like, People think that they have to take weird pauses and like do things with their head. I mean, maybe it's all, that's also a little more presentational, but I know what you mean, Tim. He really seemed like he was interviewing her and it seemed like, especially because they use the set and the, you know, you saw it through the, the way that you watch Meet the Press on NBC. It looked like Meet the Press, but that, no, that was yeah, actually the Meet the strange. Press set. That was, we, we yeah, got yeah. the legitimate Meet the Press set. Um, yeah. And uh, that was the same studio where Nixon debated Kennedy. The real With sweaty, the after, yeah, the sweaty, sweaty wow. Nixon and the and the tanned and the tanned off the beach Kennedy. That sort of that I think turned the tide of that election, right? Yeah, it was he had the like the, the five TV o'clock debate. shadow, and he he looked awful. Mm -hmm. So the interview goes really well. She gets in a great. The line about Ray Rice. Uh, this was pre Ray Rice hitting his wife in an yeah. elevator. This was back yeah. when it was fun to make a joke about Ray Rice's name, <laughs> which was Ray Rice. He playing nice. He playing nice. Uh, <laughs> that was Selena improvising, yeah. basically. Yeah. So he played nice. And as uh, and so the the interview's over. The sound guys coming to take the mic off. And she just kind of mentioned who was casually. played by Azar. I just want to say that's played by Azar Khan, who did a great job. And he ended up coming yeah, back. Yeah, he was terrific. He? The sound guy. He came back. He came back for something, and I can't remember he did? what. Yeah, he came back as the same sound guy. And I feel like there was even a moment, like when they see each other, they were like, "How oh, fuck!" Like, "Oh no!" Like, <laughs> they were like, "Oh fuck!" We all have to like watch ourselves. Um, so it, the, on a hot mic, she gets caught just kind of casually mentioning like, oh, well, you know, he wasn't born here. Um, and it's, she immediately regrets it uh, and tries to say. But doesn't she say he's not American? Yes. Oh, he's not American. It's something, it's like really specifically, because it's something he is. It's different than he's not born here. But yeah, he, he says he's not American. So he's not mm -hmm. American. And then she yeah. tries to cover it with all the stuff, like with all of the, oh, well, he, he, you know, his dad was not a, a citizen and um mm -hmm. and uh so they realize immediately amy gary and selena realize immediately that that is a nightmare and gary very confidently wants to go over and talk to the sound guy about it uh mano y mano and uh selena has a great line which is even in spanish that doesn't sound like it's gonna work <laughs> <laughs> uh gary goes over and fails to smooth it over 
and it, and in the car on the in the in the limousine after the interview it has already started to blow up like it's our people again again this like shows you where we were in the world in that they still think they can contain it rather than like that if like if that happens now that audio is just put on twitter 15 minutes later and everybody knows it right? yeah there's still a sense yeah. that they might be able to like call in a favor, call and contain it, apologize to him. But that is when uh, Gary gets his gets a bunch of bunch of her flesh caught in between the seatbelt seat buckle. Yeah, oh, the seatbelt yeah. and the seatbelt buckle, which fucks up the phone call. And they keep trying desperately to call him back. That they keep trying desperately to call Jan Danny Chung to apologize for what it will inevitably hit the press. There's a lot of good scenes in that limo. A lot of good, like just good, like small acting moments of like uh, everybody being like kind of distraught over something. Most of the time that you're in limo, like it's not, it's never exciting. It's always like a down private moment of like, Absolutely. is it this episode? I guess it's the previous episode where, where Doyle is, is all of a sudden is in the, you don't real. it's a reveal where the Doyle was in the limo and, and uh, yeah. they're having because she's like, with Catherine. It's, still- it's kind of going backwards, but I just want to say the scene with the sound guy, you don't really know what he heard, but it's one of those scenes that's a good scene because he doesn't say too much and Gary doesn't really get much from him. And I love like I love when the show does that well. Like there's there's many scenes where it's con- there's so much subtlety you're not quite sure, but it's enough to know that we're fucked. After they come in from the limo. Uh, there's another, like, I feel like one of the things that's been happening, Pete, is like, we're seeing like the beginnings of very long jokes, like very long running relationship based jokes. And one of the ones that I feel like is established here is Selena walking down the hallway saying, I can't fucking believe we sent Gary and what a terrible idea that was. And he's behind her going, yep. mm -hmm, Yes, it was. Yes. (laughs) Yes. It was a terrible (laughs) idea. Like him, her just like, openly shitting on him and he and his agreement and that yes it was it was the wrong idea i was not suited for that it was i did it was i did a bad job and so they get into the eisenhower office and uh, dan is there right away no like it's already starting to hit papers it's already starting to get out there sue arrives saying that it has to be out there out there because she is in here in here to try to help with the fallout she is looking perfect. Lines. Yeah. And also looking yeah. perfect. Like Sue has like the crazy outside life that you never quite know about. Right. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. So no. So everybody's trying to figure out how to contain it. And Jonah comes in, uh, in Madras shorts because it's a Sunday. It's a weekend and he works hot. He works hard. He works fast and he get, gets hot legs. This I had, did I had, did you, did you guys know if I had said Madras? Would you have known what that was until just now? Yes. Okay. Yes. I know it's a thing. I know what it is, but if I hadn't just seen the episode, I wouldn't be able to specifically picture what it meant. Is it a pattern or is it a type of short? It's a pattern, I think, isn't it? It's a it, pattern like Argyle or something. Right? Yes. Okay. And yes. so it's a very specific pattern. And I did find, oh, I think Arvin's going to pull it up. So I found out, number one, I found out that Matt. Can you buy me a pair of those while you're on there? Arvin, do you mind just since you're scrolling through? Just buy me some. Yeah, yeah. The, the show, the show paper. Let's hook Pete up. Yeah, let's hook Pete up with some shorts. <laughs> some magic shorts. <laughs> and the fifth caller, if you're uh, the fifth caller, one eight hundred Veep now, uh, we'll get you a pair of shorts. Just leave your uh, address and uh, credit card number and your size. We'll get out. We'll get some mattress shorts out to you. So I did not ultimately get like any sort of like brand deals with any Madras shorts people, which was upsetting at the time because I thought I really did think that there were like big things in store. We like trying to be like a mad like a Madras uh, trendsetter. Uh, but Joe comes in to let him know that uh, uh, a construction crane has collapsed in Portsmouth, Virginia, and uh, the president is stuck in economic talks. So there needs to be a VPVP, which is a vice presidential visual presence. Uh, Mike admonishes Jonah for making up acronyms and he defends himself by saying that somebody has to, which I still, I still do believe. I still do believe that I feel that was something that I threw in. And I actually do believe that somebody needs to take the, somebody needs to take the initiative to make up acronyms. To make up acronyms. They don't just happen. By the way, there's an alt that didn't make it in where she's like, do you think Jonah or the white house is going to find out? And Mike says, relax. The only pulse 
Jonah has a finger on is the vein in his wiener. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not all they're not all brilliant, but that's still pretty. Cool. <laughs> it starts out good. You're like, oh, where's this going? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's you know right. where it's going. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So he sends, so Jonah and the White House send the vice president to a local hospital where they have like the triage hospital for all these people that were uh, were hurt or injured in this crane collapse. Uh, Selena says that that's great news and says that it's all worked out. There's like a great turn of a joke where she's like, well, that worked out pretty well. And it's like two <laughs> confirmed dead and 28 injured. All right, so from there, we go to get into the hospital uh, scene where, where all the patients from that crane collapse uh, have been gathered. Um, and at the beginning, like, they don't, they aren't sure who's injured and who isn't. So Gary tells Selena that she has to converse generally with the people. And she's like, well, what about the weather? And he says, yeah, well, I mean, it has been unseasonably warm. Uh, so he plants that. And, and this is something, and we've talked about this before. <laughs> we've talked about this before. As scripted, as in the script, they go from uh, it's unseasonably warm straight to meeting that older couple who they're waiting to figure out uh, if their son is going right. to be okay. They go right into that conversation. But this is another example of Armando saying, here, is, here are all of these people. And we are just going to roll on Julia greeting them. And so everything that you see from that, from that moment of, uh, of everything that you from the see entrance. from that moment, that is all her just going through and introducing herself and trying to be vice presidential to all of the people. And it's like, you know, like, you know, the thing about like, don't turn your head. Like, oh, oh, you're her. Oh, don't, don't turn your head. I'll just give your hand a little squeeze. And, oh, yeah. and then uh, like, oh, you don't look so bad. It's like, oh, I am hurt. It's internal. And she has that face of like, oh, <laughs> internal. Uh, that's not as good as external from like, a, like, it's all in there. But that is just like, it happened so much in that first couple of years where it was just like, just yeah. roll on Julia saying hello to constituents. And something it was the amazing same will as, happen. Uh, at the end of the third episode, right? Where she was like greeting all those people. Yes. The Gary O'Keener area. Yeah, yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. I remember that because I was in that scene and I just remember like standing off to the side while she was running that from episode three. And it was like, it was just brilliant. And so much of it made it. Yeah. But there must have been so many other scenes <laughs> that were like full scenes that got cut just so she could sit there and and greet all these people in the credits roll. It was great. I mean, it was, uh, they did it for the SRBA fundraiser and they did it for this, where I'm sure she at some point said something to every single one of the people in that room and made up something specific that was incredible. Yeah. But I just always, have always loved that sort of like, oh, internal, uh, uh, that, yeah. that moment that she has. Um, and that brings us over to an older couple who are uh, waiting for their son uh, to make it out of surgery. Uh, and they talk, they sort of bemoan like how it's just a day like any other, you're enjoying the sunshine, to which Selena responds that it is unseasonably warm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it's very quickly saved from that by the, by the doctor who comes out. Uh, there is a big cheer when it turns out that... Uh, there's a big cheer when it turns out that the sun is okay. Mike lets all the press in to um, uh, to get a to get a good a sound bite that the press can nibble on. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Matt, you are heavily involved in the next moment. Do you want to take it from there? The TV moment is another one that, like, I think we rehearsed it on set mostly, but it's one of those moments that you have to get right because you say, like, you say you have like 200 people trying to shoot a TV show and we all want to get in and out and get it done. Right. So there was like the believability of like, where's the clicker? How would we do it? Cause ultimately what happens is, is the, the news yeah. comes on the TV so right during the press moment where Mike's like, okay, here's your moment media. And then it elevates to, which feels like one of those moments we talk about Tim 
uh, where the where the show is prophetic, where people just start chanting, "This is the White House, not the Yellow House." That sort of like ugly race baiting audience that's involved in the executive branch that obviously Trump used on day one when he said Mexicans are rapists. Mm -hmm. I just feel like. It's not specific to that, but it oddly feels very prophetic. I don't know. There were a few of those in those episodes, in this episode that come off of this, in that like you go, we go from there, and because of that, because of that news coming out, Doyle pulls support for the filibuster bill, which leaves the staff scrambling to find out how they could possibly get votes for filibuster reform, which lead them to Senator Bill O'Brien who is like an Arizona, like a oh, right. hard immigration reform Arizona senator. And they all decide that that's going to be the move that they're going to make. And Dan in this moment is very much, Dan very much does not give a shit. Like they, like everybody yeah. else, like Mike brings it up, like you're going to bust out. The, if we start working with that guy, we're going to bust out the pointy hoods. Like that is, that is right. a step if they are going to take it. That's a big step. And Dan is completely okay with it. He's like, it's a big win. It's a win on immigration and it's a win on filibuster reform. Like both of them, just do it. He doesn't care. And in that moment, you also have Governor Chung is live on TV and we have a second beat of the moment with the, with the remote control. Um, on the TV, it's, it's, it's about like, is Selena racist or something like that, right? Or, or like well, Chung Real American? Or what Trump, there's Chung Real American. And then there is also that, like, that nobody knows where the clicker is. And Mike is the one that finds it. And then she's like, no, Mike, give that to Sue. You're going to launch a nuke or something. Like, nuke, nobody yeah. trusts Mike with a remote once he finds it. Right. Yeah. I was actually looking up, because I know you love Friday Night Lights. Brad Leland is the guy who played Senator yes. O'Brien. And I remember oh, you were fan, you were fanboying out Tim Simons that we had that guy on our show. I was, I he was like a great actor. I was a big fan of Friday Night Lights. I did. I watched. I, I like read those books of essays like regarding Friday Night Lights, oh, where yeah. people would talk about their experiences watching it. I would also read those books. So I think it kind of makes sense that I am doing this. I am like doing a recap podcast. If I was reading books about a television show to talk to me about other people's feelings about watching that television show. So this, this, this all tracks. Um, but yeah, no, like I didn't ask for a lot of pictures, but I definitely have a picture of Brad Leland and I from when he was on set. Mm -hmm. I was very excited about that. And O'Brien plays such a big role later, you know? Five, yeah. I think it's season five. Action. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that happens in this that I noticed going through again, this sort of like points to like Sidney Purcell and you, Pete, being on board for this attitude early is that when Chung, when they mention the name of his book earlier in the episode, which I've already forgotten what it was because all these books have ultimately very forgettable, be the, the change, fight. never. No, his is the good fight. The good fight. That's right. That's right. right he has right. he has resid he has points on the good fight. Right. On the TV. Everybody makes fun of the name, the good fight. And then here he says, you know, I may uh, like the heart that beats inside my chest is red, white, and blue. Yeah. And everybody right. like, that's such a great line. If it, I mean, like it's well performed, well delivered, but everybody in the room is so cynical about him delivering that line. So well, like they have no regard for what they've done. For like what harm yeah. they've called, ca 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 they well, for what harm they've caused the world. It was just like, oh, this fucking guy with his perfect ass heart bleeds red, white, and blue. I mean, it was like, it was ridiculous. I just, I the cynicism of that moment, I think, pointed to a lot of the more cynical moments later on in the show. But they off of that. Well, that's they, what I'm saying too about he. He was so good right away with that. Yeah, he he was like he was smarmy but realistic and. Like you could see how some people would believe that type of character yes. and that all of the people that we know are like, oh, gross. Yeah. Um, which I'm sure is that's the way that everybody thinks about everything with each other in Washington. Like if someone else is like getting some juice and they're getting like their moment to shine that the other people are like ro rolling their eyes and super jealous, you know. I mean, this even was even if they're allies. This yeah. was back when like, you know, like the, the common joke was like what's the, mo the most dangerous place in washington was between senator chuck schumer and a microphone 
In the microphone, yeah. Like that was the joke about Schumer. There was one recently, like in the last couple of weeks, about Ted Cruz, like where he was a, like, you know, like talking about a tragic, um, like a tragic school shooting in Texas. And he was like, you know, I, I want to send thoughts and prayers to all the people at this school. Um, it's a tragedy that that happened. We are here today to talk about the Biden border crisis. Like he switches right. over so quickly into like the fake politician voice. And that got a lot of coverage recently. Um, but anyway, that, that, he's a, oh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say Cruz is a good example of somebody who he's like a, he's like a Chung like figure that he behaves in that way where you almost feel like, like you want to look around and be like, but everyone knows that this is just patently <laughs> bullshit, right? Like this can't be working. Any, yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. How is any, like he's the one person who, because he's so obviously is performing and he's not good at it. Like he's the one person who I'm like, you guys, come on. Like you got to know that this is, because if you want what he's selling, there's other more believable, interesting people who are doing what Ted Cruz is doing. Right. You know, mm -hmm. if you want just like a conservative, if you want a Christian, if you want, someone who's tough on, you know, immigration or whatever, like you can go to so many other places, but like why uh, the fact that people believe him is just, it's astounding to me. There is. Yeah. I have a friend yeah. whose favorite restaurant in LA is a taco place that is on his way to work or is on his way home from work. And you can take a right into the parking lot and a right out of the parking lot. And that's why it's his favorite restaurant. Because he doesn't, because he doesn't, you know what I mean? And that is, feels like Ted Cruz and that they're like, yeah, I mean, it's really good. Crazy. It's just two rights. It's just, I don't have to like get into right. like the left turn lane. It's not good enough for that. It's just good enough yeah. for like on my way home. So that speaking of uh, border state senators, we end up, this was a Frank Rich thing. Initially, this scene was going to take place in just Bill O'Brien's Senate office. And Frank was like, a, a, a like a backroom deal like that, that feels dirty. He's like, that's going to take place in a Washington steakhouse, especially with those guys. Like if those guys are in DC, they're not messing around. Like they are, they're going to go to like the most expensive steakhouse and they're going to have their meeting there. So that's why that scene was changed to this like very, you know, like leather, you know, old school leather steakhouse. Um, and right away, uh, right away, Bill O'Brien is just a total piece of shit uh, who says he doesn't know Dan. He's like, I have no idea who you are. So it's, I don't know if it's a pleasure to meet you. And then acts surprised when Amy is a chief of staff. It's like, oh, it's a woman chief of staff. Like he just immediately right. is a piece of shit. That, in this world, if you don't have to be like, if people don't have to return to you and like count on you for anything, you're allowed to just be a piece of shit. Yeah, <laughs> as a character <laughs> and as an actor, you're allowed to embody that. Like, yeah, he's like a little, he's like yeah. a little of both of those right off the bat. And as he gets more comfortable, he just goes full on, and it's something that yeah. like that uh, that Bradley Lynn did a very good job embodying, like this just sort of like immediately uber racist. He's like, don't. Don't talk to me about some insulting bill. Like, no, if you're like, you come to me with something good. And Dan immediately, again, like another prophetic thing is Dan brings up the border fence. He's like, you're not going to get a border fence. It's a 3,000 mile long fence. Which ironically would have to be built by illegal immigrants. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But one thing, yeah. one thing that I never really noticed the first time around, or at least, I'm sorry, I'm going to rephrase that. One thing that, I noticed the first time around is how dark this scene felt. Like I remember watching this and seeing Amy sell herself out and seeing how surprised And Dan is someone who earlier has proven that he doesn't give a shit about any of it. He, he is straight Machiavellian, like anything that gets us and me ahead, that is what I'm into. But he's surprised at how dark Amy goes. And like even going further, I mean, so he's like looking at her, like, I can't believe she's going that hard. And I remember thinking at the time, like, wow, like that's a dark road that the show and those characters just went down. And now it seems to be like boilerplate stump speech, like policy of the, of the, of the Republican party. Like that was a very dark thing. And now it seems like something that you just see every single day. Does that make sense? 
Right. It's not a big deal. Yeah, that's the prophetic nature of this episode. I agree. It's completely spot on. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because there's also filibuster reform on the table. Well, by the way, yeah. By the way, I just want to remind, not, Sidney Purcell is what Doyle objects to, by the way. You're the reason that Doyle doesn't want to help. Because you're so slimy, Doyle has these ethics that he does want to clean jobs for, you know, task force. and. He can't stomach, and he's a veteran politician, so it's in this world where people still had ethics, like guys like Doyle, you're so disgusting, Sidney Purcell, that he can't, I'm not going to help her. I will not help on filibuster. Yeah, it's, it seems like our, our people actually, I guess maybe Veep is like the last time that that some of this like horse trading was even like able to be parodied i don't even know if there if it's really going on anymore i guess if it is it's happening within parties and, and not across party lines yeah it does seem like that and it, like this is also i mean like if we just look at the the entire point of this episode really is that she says something incorrect and racist or that like that is like it, it turns out is based on like a dark uh, like a dark internet rumor yeah. And she spends the rest of the day trying to fix it. And now it wouldn't be even something, it would just be something you say. Like, like the idea that a politician would even try to walk something like this back is. Yeah, there wouldn't be any fixing of it. There yeah. wouldn't be any fixing. In fact, it would only just be celebrated. They would see that all those people at the, they would see all those people at the hospital cheering for them and be like, look at this. I got all these people cheering for me. I mean, like, it's just like, it's a very short amount of time that we went from that feeling like a very dark scene to one that seems completely normal. Um, yeah. So at the end of it, and it's, and it's, and it's the context of like the, what do we say? We filmed this in 2011 or yeah. Yeah. Right? The, mm-hmm. the, the sort of, for lack of a better word, fake news propagation wasn't rampant. Like these, the, the way that like lies live longer and they're harder to untangle on the internet, you could just say bullshit mm-hmm. and it just lives on and it convinces people. This is like before that really took hold and was amplified by all the algorithms that drive that stuff yeah. bouncing around the world. Well, uh, right after this thing with Bill O'Brien, where he is a grilled to, uh, agreed to back filibuster reform uh, with the enthusiasm that he pretends to love his own son who he calls a a, yeah. a nit a shit nit. I don't know what he calls him, but it was a, a word shit. that I was like, Bill O'Brien had to have brought that to the like Bill, like that must have been like a Leland line, but it was in the script. Whatever that word is that he calls his own son, it's actually in the script. Yeah. Um, and uh, which basically he's saying, I hate my own son is what's underneath it. Uh, that deal gets done. He's gonna he's gonna back Bill Buster reform. And they don't need Doyle, so that's all squared away. Uh, they are going to have to do a bunch of America First sort of rah rah uh, uh, pro Caucasian caucus stuff, and yeah, uh, that's a funny line. For her. And uh, and going back to Amy goes back to deliver that news to Selena, and she's like, "I crawled through, I crawled through the shit. I'm going to take the dirty glory for this." But Selena is already gone because she has gone home to get fucked every which way is what she says as she leaves. <laughs> like, like this weekend has been completely blown and she's like, I'm just going home to get fucked in every which way. I'm going to go home and get fucked every which way. And I just absolutely love that line. And that's the end of the episode. Yeah. And it, it, it ends also, it, it ends with like a Dan. I thought this was like, because I forgot. I was like, oh, is this the thing where Dan and Amy hook up? Because he's so like, he's almost like turned on by her dark uh side of her personality they know? had he is attracted to that her. doesn't that comes later yeah yeah they had been together at one point right and then before I, the show started, yes before the action of season one and i think that we are meant to this is like a first moment where you might see a little bit of a flicker that like this yeah. like this like this horrible dark thing that she's done has really brought brought her up in his estimation there's a line in the script that O'Brien says, which is like, what do you guys have against the Chinese? I like them. They talk more sense than we do about unions when it comes to unions. Yeah. Oh my God. 
So he's sounding like this evolved guy, and then he ends it with that. It's just amazing. But the, I tell you, the, I wish I could do a yeah. Tiananmen Square every now and then. You know, yeah. clean <laughs> just to clean up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. just to clean up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But again, that's yeah. like a shocking thing to have said at the time, but it feels like within a couple of years, you had people say, like, I think like a few years later, Mitt Romney did talk about like the work about like, you know, in a positive way about like, you know, you should see all these people in China. They just can't wait to get working at these jobs. And he's talking about like a 40 cent an hour factory job. Yeah. And he's like, man, you should see everybody. They just want to work so hard over there. Like, I mean, like it really, it was taken from the back rooms and just put right, just front and center it, front and center in the campaigns. Pete, yeah. it's really great having you on, man. Uh, again, yeah, I, I, I think we'll end up having you, if you will, if you will, and, and it would be great to have you in studio at some point as well, if you're ever done filming in Savannah or if you ever come back to Los Angeles, it'd be fun to see you in person. I know we'll end up having you back on at some point just because... You are somebody that you carry on. Aren't you at the funeral? Are you at the funeral at the very no, end? No, I'm not at the funeral. I have a great, I don't want to spoil it for people who are only listening to this without having watched <laughs> the, the end of the <laughs> watched a single moment of the series. But I have a good, I have a good, they wrote me like a nice little thing at the end of, in, in uh, season seven that I get arrested. For, oh, uh, that's right. Oh my God. I think for like embezzlement or something. But I, it was really fun because I went downstairs with um, Morgan Sackett and we like took pictures. We took like, uh, I got like mugshot pictures and stuff <clears throat> when I was there <laughs> on the last day. Yeah, it was really fun. So, I mean, so I, mean, I know we're going to have you back on because you are somebody that lived in the show from what? Yes, episode three. From episode three up until the finale, yeah, so you were you lived in the show for yeah. seven years. So I know we'll have you back on, and especially I. Oh, that's great! I'd love it. You'd be getting and a you lot were of constantly shout-outs. being put on hold and told to, you're coming back, and then you wouldn't <laughs> yeah. hear anything for months, and then they would call you and say you're working tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pack all your stuff up and fly it. We well, need you in Baltimore. When I was living in New York, when I was living in New York, and it was go to Baltimore, I was really wonderful because i would just like go to the train station and just get, yeah. get on the train and yeah. it was very nice <clears throat> it was super easy yeah. and then you know going to la was also like fun as well but the ball the baltimore time was very special it just felt like it, it felt like why are we shooting a tv show in baltimore <laughs> i guess <laughs> they even had all the buildings like looked like federal buildings and and you know all the, the i never was on the set you know i wasn't on like the 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 White House set mm-hmm. that you guys were on, but all the buildings that I was in always look like, yeah, this looks like a federal building, like just marble. All they just needed to find was like different marble staircases. Yeah. For me to be on. The Mid Atlantic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Sydney Purcell, AKA Pete Gross. You're the best. We're going to have you, you on guys. again for your later appearances in the seasons, <clears throat> if you don't mind. Um, I do. I do mind, but thank you. And is there anything you want to plug just, as a just friend of the, the show? Do you want to plug anything? Oh, as a plug? Um, no, you don't, don't have to. Think okay, so no pressure. I have That's nothing to plug. Me neither. Just, just, just rewatch Veep. Just listen to more of this podcast. I'm plugging. I'm on the the Veep rewatch podcast. Second <laughs> man. That's something I'm doing. Um, I think if okay. people would listen to that, that'd be great. Folks, yeah. uh, that's look, coming out. That's coming out real soon. Yeah, look for that. Look for Pete Gross in this uh, yep. second in command. It's called, I believe it's called Second in Command. It's a okay. V free watch podcast. It's really fun. It's two of the guys that were on the show. They sort of go through the episodes and they have people on who are involved in the show. So oh, it's really sounds, great. It sounds, sounds I don't know. Yeah. It sounds I too- mean, it's derivative, but it's. I think it'll be fun. Yeah. You know, it's not like an original format, but it's, you know, no. it'll be really fun. Sounds a little too inside for baseball you. for me. I don't, I don't know. It's not really my thing. <laughs> not your thing. I understand. All right. Thanks, Pete. Goodbye. Okay. Well, guys. Be well. See ya. All right, Washi, uh, we're going to do walk backs or double downs. Um, and I, I'm going to walk back a little bit for harshing on you about the T in Pete Groats because okay. the spelling is misleading. Like, I, I guess I don't look at his name that often, but when you look at the spelling, there is a T in the end of that name. And uh, it just, uh, I was hearing it. I'm like, Ugh. But you're right. You're 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 making a good guess at how it could sound. So I'm walking that back a little bit. It's the the T and the Z, right? It's great. G R O T Z. P G R O S T Z. G R O S T Z. Like the T and the Z are doing so much work there. They are begging you for attention. 
You know what I mean? Like, ignore, yeah. They are there saying like, pronounce me. And so I think that's like, when I first saw that name, I was like, that is pronounced says Like I'm really hitting the, the T and the Z because I feel like they're, they are, they are there asking for attention. You know, don't, making the S, making the S silent for whatever reason you're saying. I know. The I'm, silent. I'm, I, I fucked this up. I thank you for walking that back. I don't know that I deserve it. I don't deserve like yes. your sympathy. I don't deserve your sympathy or empathy because I am fucking it up. But but thank you. Uh, next week we're going to be rewatching episode five, nicknames, uh, which was originally called Dan dates Jonah. That was the original title of that episode, but it ended up mm-hmm. um, being called nicknames. Uh, I fought hard behind the scenes to get to not get that changed. It was it caused a rift with HBO. I almost didn't come back for the second season over this, but it was ultimately called nicknames. Uh, with special guests, our very good friend Reed Scott is going to be rewatching that Woo-hoo. one. Thanks for watching Second in Command of Veep Rewatch. Yeah, please hit the subscribe button and tune in every Tuesday when the new ones drop. Rewatch the show for exclusive behind the scenes stuff, info, insight, and more. Episodes coming, and thanks for watching. Yeah, hit that uh, subscribe button. This is the mouse arrow, right? That's what you're representing. It's the a cursor. Of- Put it, do a little circle with your finger and it'll, it'll like be bigger so you can see where it is. Oh, okay.